Good afternoon. UC Master Gardeners of San Mateo and San Francisco counties welcome you to our second of our spring edible series uh, entitled Caring for Your Tomato Seedlings. Our presenter today is Judith Dean. Judith has been a Master Gardener since 2006 and has attended propagation classes at Foothill College, San Francisco Botanical Garden, and Filoli. She is a long-term propagator of tomatoes and other vegetables from seeds, and you all have a real treat in store. During the presentation, you will have an opportunity to type in any questions you may have. Uh, type in the name of your city before typing in the question. During the presentation, our chat monitors will uh, select questions for Judith to answer. If your question is not answered, you can always type in your questions on our MG helpline and a copy of the presentation and video will be found on our UCMG website within the week and you can find information about that uh, on the final slide. And now let me present Judith. You Start again. This is, zooming is uh, sometimes a trick. Okay, I wanted to say welcome. And we're really going to talk about a lot of the warm weather crops, not just tomatoes, but we'll talk a lot about tomatoes because that's what most of us are really excited about getting uh, in the ground and getting some fruit. Um, kit. Yeah. So we're going to talk a little bit about the, the botany and the fruit setting and the uh, aspects of tomatoes, eggplants, and peppers, because they all are very similar and they all belong to the nightshade family. Um, if you know anything about the nightshade family, it was at one time thought to be all poisonous, horrible things, but now we know there's a lot of good stuff in there. Interesting thing here is that where this species came from, Western South America and Central America. So when you look at some of the other plants, you'll see some similarities here. When you're choosing your tomatoes, it's good to know there's sort of a, a lingo that's used about tomato types. And uh, these things are sometimes not obvious if you're a beginner. So you can look around and see these classic beefsteak, paste, and cherry. If you've had a bad time getting a crop before, Try the cherry tomatoes. Around here, the cherry tomatoes really do well because they're small and it doesn't take very much to get them to mature. So that's just a little tip about choosing a type. And they have two different growth habits, indeterminate and determinate. You'll often see that on the information about a given variety. The indeterminate ones grow very large and need to be definitely need to be corralled otherwise you'll have them sprawling all over and the tomatoes will rest on the ground and get uh, nasty and the determinate ones not only are smaller but the fruit comes all at once and all at once being within a, about a two-week period it's really good if you've got a small garden or if you can only can grow in small pots and it's also good if you do canning because it's nice to have your crop come in all at once, then you have lots of tomatoes and you can just go to town. Tomatoes fruit set fruit, uh, mostly from wind pollination because they are self pollinating and they don't, that means they don't cross with other tomatoes. You only need one. The temperature has to be over 55 and under 90 degrees. And that is a, one of the things to keep in mind because when we have those horrible hot hot days which i think in august last year we had some beastly days the tomatoes and peppers and eggplants all kind of go into hibernation in a way and they don't set fruit and they don't create uh new flowers and about two weeks after the heat spell you start to notice i don't have any baby tomatoes what happened well what happened was two weeks ago it got too hot and the tomato to protect its uh, fruit bearing um, potential just shuts down. And the other thing to check is the days to maturity. 
the harder time you have growing tomatoes, the shorter the days to maturity you should choose. So if you were over in the Central Valley with lots of heat, you could grow great big beefsteak tomatoes and they would be, they would have plenty of time to mature. But if you're in the cooler parts of the Bay Area, you want to choose some of the extra early or early or mid. And if you've got lots of room, go ahead and try a, a, one of the late varieties because we've been having warm summers that last quite a while and you might be able to get a crop out of it. And the other thing to check for tomatoes uh, is their disease resistance. I think all of us who've tried to grow tomatoes know that tomatoes are subject to lots and lots of problems. Most of them soil borne. And it makes it really hard to get away with a full year without something turning yellow or icky and, and looking bad. If you choose a variety that says that it's resistant to these particular problems, you'll help yourself a lot. And the, all the uh, common abbreviations are here. You'll often see something that says VF hybrid. And that VF is not Veterans of Foreign Wars, it's Verticillium fusarium, because those are the two most common soil borne diseases around our area. Especially if you have to plant your tomatoes again and again in the same spot, in the same soil, you really ought to look at the disease resistant ones because these are soil borne diseases. And if you keep planting the crop over and over, even if you plant one of the other nightshades, you're kind of asking for trouble. So pay attention to the to the disease resistance. Peppers, next. Uh, get. Peppers are in the nightshade family and they're native to Mexico and Central America. So again, they're native to a place where there's a good bit of, good bit of heat. And in particular, peppers need a lot of heat to grow well. If you don't get a lot of heat, you're not likely to get a very hot pepper. Sometimes Mother Nature comes forth with one, but the really hot peppers come from really hot regions of, the, of our country or from Mexico or Central America. And remember that the seeds and veins are the hottest part. So when you go to use one, you have to kind of get rid of that if you haven't got a taste for hot peppers. Uh, and even one of the peppers that doesn't have a potential, says it isn't hot, the way the genetics work on those peppers, about one in 10 is going to have some heat. So before you dump the whole pepper into your stew or whatever you're using them for, just nip a little bit off and taste it and find out if yours is the one in 10 that's going to go, that's really hot. So there are two, two main types of peppers, the bell peppers and the hot peppers. Bell peppers are big and fleshy and the hot peppers are usually smaller. Um, but they both need uh, nice warm nights to, to set fruit and they need days that are uh, in the 70s and maybe up to 85 for the hot peppers. Again, over 90 causes these to do that same thing that tomatoes do, just kind of go to sleep. Peppers do cross pollinate really easily. And that means if you save seed and you plant it, you may or may not get the same pepper that you pull the seeds from. So don't be surprised, but you might have a really great variety uh, that turns out to be you know, wonderful for your garden, but don't be surprised. Okay, eggplant comes from South Asia and it, is, it has two main types, the globe eggplant and the Japanese eggplant. Around here, the globe eggplant has, needs more heat than we generally have. If you're in one of the warmer parts of the Bay Area, you'll probably be okay. But if you're off on the coast or you're in a cooler part of the Bay Area, the Japanese eggplants are usually a better bet. They, they um, mature quickly. And that also means they don't have the seeds uh, that the big globe eggplants have. So it's a good thing to look for. Eggplants have that same problem. If the temperature goes out of the range that they like, they are going to drop their blossoms and then you 
have a gap in their fruit production. They're self-pollinating and they're wind pollinating. Now with the pollination that we talked about with tomatoes and little less so of peppers and eggplants, because they're wind pollinated and maybe you've tried to get the heat they need by putting them in a part of your garden that has very little wind. You might want to come along then and shake your plants to give a chance to get that pollen moving around, the, around your plant. There's actually a little tool called a veggie bee because you know they're bee pollinated, right? And a little veggie bee shakes the blossoms to get the pollen loose. And I read somewhere somebody even used their electric toothbrush and put it around each of the flowers to shake loose the pollen. I thought that was pretty funny. Next. So now we've kind of know what those, those kinds of plants want. And let's talk about how you're gonna transplant them. All of these crops need warm soil. So if you're, if you're anxious and you really wanna get out there and put them in the ground in the nice cold soil that we have right now, you're just asking for trouble. Planting too early leads to stunted growth, it leads to pest problems. Wait till Mother's Day before you put your peppers, eggplants, and tomatoes out into your, into your garden. It really will help. They'll come along so fast when the soil is warm, they'll catch up with the ones you put in earlier and they'll overtake them really because they're healthier. You can, in the meantime, while you're waiting, you've got these four inch pots that you bought your plant in and that might not be quite enough soil for the plant as it begins to get bigger and bigger. So it's a good idea to take a one gallon container, maybe a bigger pot if you have around or one gallon container from some other plant you bought, fill it with some potting soil and move, move your four inch uh, plant into the bigger gallon container so that it has a chance to continue to grow with more soil around it. Especially for tomatoes, plant it really deep. Handle the seedlings by their leaves and not by the stem. If you think about it, the, leaf, the plant has lots of leaves. So if you mash down too hard on a leaf, it's not the same as if you mash down too hard on the stem. You hit, if you get the stem too hard, then you break all the capacity for the roots to send the nutrients up and the leaves to send the chlorophyll down into the, into the roots. So leaves, not stem, and put them in a nice sheltered spot near water. So the way you do your up potting is you're gonna water both the seedling and the soil in the container. The rule of thumb is damp into damp. Um, that gives that less transplant shock that way. It's a good idea to pinch off any blossoms that you see. Uh, you want your plant to concentrate on growing roots at first, because that's what supports the plant throughout its life. It's very hard to, for, to prune those little blossoms off because you, in your mind you think, oh my gosh, I might have the first tomato before, you know, my friends do, or I'll have one early. And yeah, maybe you will, but when the plant sees that it can set fruit, it kind of decides that it, it's ready to go into a different stage of growth. We want to keep it in the stage of growth where it's putting out a lot of leaves and a lot of roots, so it'll be a strong plant and carry a big crop for you later. Again, you want to bury it deeply up to the up to the top two leaves. So you're going to peel off all the leaves up to the top two sets of leaves and put it in. Sometimes you're putting that plant in four or five inches deeper than it was in the in the transplant pot. But it's a good idea because tomatoes, especially, can grow roots out of their stem. All those little hairy things you see along the along the stem, those can turn into roots. And the more roots there are, the more nutrient gathering capacity your plant's going to have. You need them to be sheltered from the wind in a warm area, and you need to water them regularly, especially on the windy days. On a windy day, they can need water twice a day, especially if they're in a pot, when they're just babies. Okay. Location is the most important thing. You've got to have them in a sunny spot or at least a really warm spot. Uh, I have to say, uh, where I grow tomatoes, I don't have eight to 10 hours of sun, but I do have six 
and it's warm because it gets reflected heat. So that'll work too. Um, morning light is better than afternoon light if you have to choose. And please wait until the soil is warm. You know, if you check our daytime temperatures, you start to see the nighttime temperatures creeping up, but the soil doesn't creep up as fast as the air does. So you have to wait till we've had a fair amount of nighttime temperatures over 50 before you can count on the soil being over 50. To help, you can um, increase the light intensity. You can plant in front of a white wall that'll bounce light onto your plant. You can put mirrors or foil covered boards behind. To increase the warmth, row covers. If you're not familiar with row covers, they're really a great thing to use. They do a lot of good for you. Um, they keep the bugs off, which is a good idea. Uh, they help hold in a little bit of moisture and that raises the humidity and particularly tomatoes come from a humid area. So that's not a bad deal. So um, look into frost cloth or row cover and see, I think you'll find that that's a really valuable tool for you. Uh, wind protection we talked about. The other thing you can do that's kind of homemade but works is find a good sized rock or put water in a, in a clear plastic bottle and put it next to your plant because what that does is it gathers the heat during the day and it radiates it out at night and that helps fool the plant into thinking it's growing in a warmer climate. Mulching with black or red plastic under your plant does a couple things. Uh, it helps keep the moisture in, which is good. Um, it helps keep the weeds out, which is good. So there's a lot of reasons to try to um, put some mulch around your plant. And you can grow things in, it says growing bag, but really all that is is a bag of potting soil. You buy it at the nursery, cut an X in the top and fold back the flaps, put, poke, poke some drainage holes in the bottom, and off you go. Um, I should stop and take some questions at this point. Megan? Yes, we have um, a question from someone in Palo Alto. Yeah. Uh, wondering about whether or not soil solarization works for tomatoes. Okay, soil solarization is, what, let me explain, is where you moisten your soil, you put clear plastic over the soil and then hold it down with rocks or something. And then you hope for some really hot weather that will come along and essentially set up a little greenhouse effect under that, that plastic and heat the soil up, which kills the weed seeds. It works for the weed seeds. I don't think it's a strong enough heat to kill oh, some of the soil borne diseases, but I would have to uh, really research that to be sure about it. I'd say it's a good idea to do, um, but just to keep the weed seeds down, but don't count on it killing verticillium and fusarium uh, because they're really soil borne down deep below what the solarization can probably do. Okay, and we have another question. Can tomatoes grow for many years like a pepper plant? Um, I've heard of people being able to do it. It is technically perennial, so maybe you can. The thing about tomatoes though, and even peppers and eggplants too, they like to collect diseases. The longer they're in that in the ground and the weaker they get, the more likely they are to pick up a disease. So in my mind, digging them up and putting in fresh soil or, or putting the plant somewhere else is the best practice. But sometimes it's just fun to see what can happen. I certainly carry pepper over and eggplant over. I never have carried a tomato over. They're just too finicky and I worry that this plant is not going to be as strong as a nice fresh new one that I can plant really deep and I can put fresh soil in. Um, we have another question on um, the planting peppers. Do you, do you transplant peppers deep like you do the tomatoes? You can, but um, I don't think it's as important. What is a good idea on peppers is to pinch out the growing tip. The last two little leaves up at the top, we give them a little pinch because that'll make it get bushier. And the bushier it is, the more fruit it's gonna set. 
So you just nip off that top little little bit. And you could do that to eggplant too, although I don't think that makes as much a difference as it does with peppers. Okay, we've got one more question here before we can move on. Um, for the gallon pot seedlings before transplanting, we would take them out each day for the sun and then take them back inside at night? Well, you don't have to take them inside. You just need to move them back to where they're protected. Thank you. I have this vision of your dining table full of gallon pots. <laughs> okay. So when you grow in containers, the larger the container, the better. Um, people say, oh, I got a crop out of a little one gallon can. And what I say to that is, you were lucky. Uh, increase your chances and use a bigger pot. Doesn't have to be a fancy pot, but the bigger it is, the more soil there is for the plant to draw on and it doesn't dry out as quickly because the tiny pots are gonna be out there watering all the time, it's a real pain. We use good potting soil. Garden soil tends to be around here, particularly clay and kind of, uh, I think the British say claggy, I like that word, it's a, it's a good one, but it, it really isn't the best soil if your plant's gonna be 100% dependent on that pot soil. And the soil will dry out really quickly in a pot. So a couple things, one is you need to check the water more regularly, but the other thing is it's a good idea to shade the side of the pot that the sun hits. It, it tends to heat the pot up and then that burns off the roots that are closest to that hot pot. And the more roots you have, the better. So try to shade the pot, just the pot, not the plant on, on its sunny side. Okay, we talked a little bit about when to transplant, but I'm gonna go back to saying it again because it's a real hobby horse of mine. Uh, if you plant a little later, you will have much better effect. Please try to wait until early May before you really you know, go at it. Um, hardening off is the process of putting your transplants out where they're going to grow at, starting a few days before you're gonna plant them. So they get used to the fact they're not always gonna have this lovely little cozy nest. They're gonna to have to exist in the real world and bring them back if, this, if you're gonna have a windy day, don't try it. If you're gonna have a super, super cold day, don't try it. But if it's gonna be kind of a normal day, put them out um, and let them get used to things. Then at night, bring them back to the more sheltered area or cover, or cover them up with that frost cloth or row cover. Depend, that's a, those names are both the same thing. It's a white uh, translucent, um, kind of fabric that you can get at most nurseries or on the internet. Transplanting, it's a good idea to avoid a really windy or warm day. And I always try to transplant in the late afternoon if I can. It gives the plant all night to get used to its new surroundings and hydrate and be happy. Again, if you when you transplant, you wanna transplant a damp plant into damp soil. Support your plants right from the start. You need to put the, the support in. If you wait till it's you know drooping all over everywhere, you you'll break some stems. They are they're somewhat fragile. So remember that with an indeterminate tomato, it can get 12 feet tall. At least count on it being six to eight feet tall and give it support. The the more it's supported and the more you keep it up. Uh, in, uh, in the air, the better the air circulation will be. And air circulation helps prevent disease. So trying to get it up in, and support it is really a good idea. You can tie it to a stake. You can put uh, some of the tomato, commercial tomato cages, they just aren't big enough. You have to kind of build up from that, uh, but they're a good start. That's what I take two tomato cages and turn one on top of the other and wire them together. So I have sort of a dunce cap at the top and uh, the regular legs at the bottom. And that gives me just about six feet. And even then it spills over the top. And watering. 
all these crops are very fleshy and fleshy crops really need a lot of water. So good steady supply every couple of days until the plant is really well established. Every couple of days when we have nasty hot spells, at least check and be sure, stick your finger in the soil and if it doesn't come out damp up to like, if you stick your finger in up to your first knuckle, it, you should feel some moisture down at the tip. If you don't, you might need to put some, some water around it. Um, and I pull the lower leaves off, particularly the tomatoes, as uh, they, you know, they begin to hang down and get in contact with the soil, is that means they're going to pick up some diseases. And I don't want any more diseases than the tomatoes already know how to get. So I just pull those off and it helps with the airflow. And you will need um, just to, you know, pull, pull them off with your fingers or you can snip them off with your, your uh, cutters. So with container plants, you need to water a lot. Uh, sometimes the best practice is to water a little in the morning and a little in the evening, because otherwise you get a lot of runoff. And runoff wastes water, and we can't afford to waste any water in California. Next, yeah. Fertilizing. If your soil is really well prepared, and it's good soil, you don't need a whole lot until you see the fruit. I actually think until you see a pretty good crop of, of flowers. You might want to start thinking about it. And low nitrogen, high phosphorus, potassium, don't worry about the chemicals, just look at the bag and if it says if the first number is lower than the second two numbers, that's what you want to use. It'll often say tomato and vegetable on it. That's a good idea for that. A trick I use, if the bag says use a tablespoon, let, let's say it says use half a cup in a gallon of water every two weeks. I make a weaker solution. So I'll use a quarter cup in a gallon and I'll water every week. Because that means that the plant has always got something available. It's like if you only got fed once every two or three days, you wouldn't be very happy. Even if you got the same number of calories that you would have you know, had over the course. I just feel it's better for the plant to try to give it a little boost more frequently. And I actually talked to some of the gardeners out at Filoli and you know those incredible displays they have of those big um, delphiniums and all, that's what they do. They, that. And follow your feeding, which is where you spray the um, fertilizer on the leaves and do in the early morning so everything's nice and dry by the time the sun goes down. You don't need to do a whole lot. And when you start to see yellowing, sometimes your temptation is to say, oh my goodness, it needs fertilizer. Now, probably what's happening is you're, you're seeing some disease setting up and giving it fertilizer when it doesn't need fertilizer doesn't help and sometimes causes problems. So kind of stick with the plan for uh, only a, two or three times a season. This is to remind you about planting deep. Uh, see how deep this is? Uh, they peeled off all the leaves from the soil line up to the top two sets of leaves. And if you can't get it in, in your soil uh, that straight up, it's okay to put it on an angle. The plant will sort itself out. After you transplant, when the soil's warmed up a lot, more than just the beginning. It's a good idea to put two or three inches of organic mulch on the top, but you can put it right over the plastic. Uh, it helps keep the uh, temperature of the soil consistent. So it's not going up, up during the day and down, down at night. And uh, one thing I can tell you about where these plants grow is they're nearer to the equator than we are, which means they have more equal day and night. What, we have dramatic, changes in the in the summer particularly between our day and nighttime um, amount of light we have and our temperature change that um, in the in the tropics in those areas the temperature change will be about 10 degrees day to night in our area it'll be around 20 degrees so putting some mulch there helps keep the soil from drop temp dropping temperature too much during the night 
but you need to pull it back a little ways from the stem, your mulch, so that you don't um, cut the airflow. And the weeds, of course, you have to keep them away because they're going to compete with your plant. And pulling off yellow and deformed leaves, you know, sometimes we get tempted when we see some yellow deformed leaves to say, oh, well, this is terrible. I'm just going to pull it up. I got incredible crops last year of a plant that looked like every time I went by it, I thought, oh, I could just pull that out. It's just awful. But sometimes they keep plugging along. So give it a chance, maybe a week or two. If you, if you can't stand the way it looks well, then there's always the farmer's market. And when we have one of those real hot spells where it goes up over 90, it's a good idea to shade tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants because the, the fruit will sunburn. And where it sunburns, it'll, it'll get um, kind of nasty and, and useless. And you don't want that after you've gone to all the work to grow these. So go ahead and put, put up a little shade, frost cloth or whatever you've got to protect your fruit during those hot spells. So let's talk about a few other of the warm season plants. Basil, which we all like a lot and goes so well with tomatoes and eggplants. And I've never thought about it with pepper, but my, it wants a warm soil too. So this is again, a plant that should wait before it goes into its forever home. Just keep, you know, do the up potting and pinching, taking the last two leaves off the ends of the stems so that it'll branch out. And the other thing it does is it prevents the basil from forming flowers. Because once the basil has formed flowers, it thinks its work is done and it'll just start to fade on you or sometimes even get kind of funny tasting. So just keep pinching out those tips. You can use them. They're perfectly good and it helps make the plant branch out. Summer squash. They like warm soil, but they're not quite as fussy as tomatoes, eggplants, and pepper. You can kind of build up a mound and put your squash seed into that, and that will give them probably enough uh, protection to allow you to grow them. Um, they often have problems with pollination. And they're, one thing you can do is do your own pollination. Take a Q-tip or, or a little tiny brush and go into the male flower. Male flower has, is long and slender, has no little bulge at the base. And rub around till you pick up some pollen. Take a freshly opened female, which is, will have a little bulbous growth at the bottom and take your pollen in there and pretend you're the bee and help it with pollination. That's a squash sometimes have a, have a problem with that. The first things you'll see on a squash plant are going to be the male flowers. If you want to pick them off and use them because they're edible, go right ahead because it, it will take until you see some female flowers on your squash plant before you have any chance of getting uh, any kind of fruit. Um, I mentioned shaking tomatoes and a um, good thing to do is put pollinator plants all over your vegetable growing area so you attract lots of bees. Um, let me stop and take some questions. Um, somebody said that they use red porous film under their tomatoes and does the research show that it improves a yield or not? I've seen some research that says it improves and I've seen people say that's, you know, just kind of a, uh, what do they call it, grandma's tail. Okay. I think it probably does help, but I don't have any University of California research to back that up. Um, I will look that up and uh, try to put that answer to that on our website in in the um, in our along with the slides from the presentation. Okay. Uh, one person wants to know if plastic or chemicals in the tires leach out into the soil. I think they do. I think they do too. I think they do. If you're going to do that, uh, line it with plastic. You know, take a big old plastic garbage bag and line it with plastic. But I think it's pretty chancy. I, I would find some other thing. Okay. What peppers grow well on the coast? Hmm. Well, the smaller the pepper, the better chance you're going to have. The shorter the growth period, the better chance you're going to have. 
So look at the size of the pepper, look at the length of time before it actually, you know, bears fruit and choose one of the short, short uh, time and small peppers. And that's your best hope. And try to surround it with as much heat as you can get it. Tin foil, mirrors, everything you, you got. I used to, I, when I was a kid, I lived in Half Moon Bay. I know what you're talking about. It, if you want to grow something in the fog, you're in good shape, but peppers need a lot of heat. Okay. So find someplace hot and give it a try. You know, if it doesn't work, you've learned something. And that probably means you can't overwinter peppers, correct? No, that doesn't necessarily mean that because also on the coast, you don't get the frost. Okay. Um, what are the benefits of using fabric grow bags? Uh, what the manufacturers say is that it, it allows the roots to breathe more easily and that may or may not be true. I don't know of any UC sponsored research on the benefit of grow bags, the fabric grow bags versus uh, pots. I use fabric grow bags. I've had really good luck with them, but I use them primarily because they don't take up very much room when I'm not actually got a crop in them. Um, I don't see any marked difference myself, but that's just me, one, math, one gardener, not, not uh, a real research study. Okay. Are we going to have another question answer time? Because there's a lot of questions here. Shall I just read a couple more? Yeah, go ahead. All right. I was supposed to stop earlier, so. Okay. I owe you. <laughs> Should you back off watering tomatoes to get more fruit? There is a theory that dry farmed tomatoes have more flavor, not more fruit. And there are places that do dry farming I think uh, there's Love Apple Farm over in Santa Cruz, I want to say, but somewhere near there. And they dry, dry farm theirs. Uh, they, they have in, go to incredible lengths to get their soil in good shape, way down deep. And they, they do a lot. I, I tried it one time and I just didn't think that it did much other than make the plant really unhappy. But go ahead, give it, give it a try. See if you think it, it, it improves it. The thing about the Bay Area is we have so many different uh, growing conditions around the Bay Area that what works for me here in Menlo Park might not work for you in up in Burlingame. We and your soil might be different than my soil. So if you're going to be a gardener, you kind of have to accept the fact that you're not always going to be successful and think of it as just a learning experience so that you get to be the expert on your garden. Is there anything you can do to salvage a tomato that gets blight early? I would pull it out. Okay. Blight can be passed from plant to plant. If you have more than one tomato, then the blight will more likely get passed around. So if it were me and it was my tomato, I'd pull it out. I would not put it in my compost. I would I would even probably not put it in the in the city pickup, although they get their compost really hot and it should kill the blight. But it blight is just very destructive. And when you get it early on, there really isn't a lot you can do about it that most people would be willing to do. And I say that because I think most of us now know that um, using a lot of pesticides and a lot of strong chemicals in our gardens is just bad for the environment, bad for our health. And so I, Frankly, I would pull it out. Okay, um, I'll do two more. On watering, I heard that in the past, it's better to water less often and water more so that the roots get a chance to dry out between waterings. Is this true or was I given bad advice? No, you, that, that, is what the, that is what we're taught. Okay. But, this is, this is just my but, if you have heavy clay soil, it just does not absorb the water, it just pools up around your plants. So what I do, um, I have a, a controller for my irrigation system and I set it to water a little bit in the morning and then a little bit in, in the afternoon, early afternoon, so that the plant has a chance to absorb or the soil has a chance to absorb the water because runoff is a waste and that's, we can't afford to waste water. So if your soil doesn't pool up water, then yeah, that's the best thing because it makes the plant um, develop roots deeper down. But if you have the kind of 
really clay soil like I do, a little bit more often is better. And don't tell anybody a master gardener told you that because we are not taught that that's right. That's just my experience. Okay, here's the last one. An old wise tale says that planting a banana peel around the tomatoes is very helpful. Well, you know what? It can't hurt anything. <laughs> it's like compost. It, it'll compost. It's got a lot of potassium in it. Uh, some people put eggshells because it has calcium. So both of those things, you have it handy and it's going to rot in there. I don't think it would do any harm. I don't know that it would be remarkably better, but you know, you could put two tomatoes side by side and feed one eggshells and feed one bananas and see who does better. <laughs> All right, that's it for now. You can keep going. Thank you. Oh. oh. So. <laughs> okay. All right, Megan. Okay, let's see. We had a question about a community garden that recently made a rule that to ban all tomatoes, eggplants, and potatoes for three years because of a nightshade fungal bacteria in all the soil. Is this really necessary? Uh, if you go by the books, yes. Yeah, if, you're, if you go by the books, yes. Uh, and if you're in a community garden, I can see why they would wanna be very careful because what you might be willing to take a risk on in your home garden um, is one thing, what you take a risk on and you affect everybody else's plants that, probably would be undesirable, but it does take a long time to get rid of these soil-borne diseases. They're really nasty, verticillium, fusarium, and they don't just affect tomatoes. I mean, verticillium can get Japanese maples and all kinds of plants. It's really nasty stuff, and it's almost impossible to stop once it's started. So I can understand why they made that rule, and there's lots of other dandy plants you can uh, learn about while you're waiting your three-month three-year quarantine. We're all getting used to quarantine now anyway, aren't we? Okay, um, we also had a question about what mulch is best. The mulch that you have is the best mulch there is. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't think there's a perfect mulch. If, if it's going to pr provide a, a barrier for weed seeds to come up and if it's going to help keep the soil warm. I don't think it makes an awful lot of difference what you use. Some mulches uh, have a little more nutrient in them than others. Sometimes people worry about a wood-based mulch drawing nitrogen out of the soil, but in the end, it's just better to mulch than not to mulch. And if what you have is a lot of leaves that you ground up, or if you have pine needles that are handy or oak leaves or you went to the um, supply store and got mulch from them. The important thing is get the mulch on there. Mulch is even important in the winter. You know, around here with our clay soils, when that rain that we get usually is a kind of pounding rain, that pounds the soil and knocks all of the oxygen carrying um, capacity out of these clay soils. So it's really a good idea to keep mulch on your soil year round, not just when you've got some um, plants in the, your vegetables in there. That's great. Uh, let's see, we have some questions about squash. Um, how do you tell, if you can repeat, how to tell male from female flowers on the squash? Okay, the male flowers are more long and slender. They come first on the plant. So. Go out, as soon as you see a flower, go out and look at it because that's going to be a male flower, almost for sure. And see that it's very slender all the way from the flower into the stem. There won't be a big bulge. The female, the flower will terminate in a kind of a little, little bulge, not tremendously big, but it's really observable. And then it'll go into the stem and that's the female flower. And you're going to do pollination yourself, remember that the fresher the flower, the better luck you're going to have. So wait till you have a, a female flower that's just ready to open and get the pollen from your male flower and stick it in there. And you probably want to do that 
you know, a lot. The bees are much more efficient than we are. Okay. What non-cherry tomato varieties would you recommend for San Francisco foggy climates? I tell you, I don't have any experience growing in San Francisco. If there are master gardeners out there that grow in San Francisco and have a recommendation, chime in. Anybody? Aren't the sun golds supposed to work really well for San Francisco? We do, but they're cherry tomatoes. I mean, if you want a non-cherry tomato, I'll just say this, stick with the smaller of the non-cherry tomatoes and give it a try. It depends on where you are in the city too. If you're out on the avenues, I would say forget it, but that would be offensive. Um, you'll have more of a challenge. I think that's the polite thing to say. If you're in some of the warmer areas of San Francisco, you might, you might be able to get away with a, a larger one. Now, I, I will put a plug in for this, the um, Master Gardener Spring Garden Market. Uh, I think we're growing a variety Correct me if I'm wrong, guys. San Francisco Sunrise. And yes. that was bred by a master gardener for San Francisco. It gets quite large. And I heard a lot of good things from people who lived in the city who live in the city who got good crops with it. If that doesn't, if you can't get a hold of that, there are there are tomatoes that were bred for Oregon. Stupice is one. I'm trying to remember another one. Um, but that one's to be, uh, because it was bred for the part of Oregon that it doesn't get real warm, it, it, it tends to be pretty good. It um, might not work in the city, but it's worth a try. And there are some tomatoes that were bred for uh, colder areas of Russia. And they often have names that are kind of the giveaway, like Natasha or, um, or Minsk. And if you see the names that look kind of Russian, chances are those were bred for uh, the climate. There's one called San Francisco Fog, but I haven't heard anybody say that it was tremendously successful. So um, I'll go back to what I said before, try to get one with the shorter days to maturity, try to get one that's not real big. The beef steaks are gonna be a big challenge, but if you're the person that likes a big challenge, go right ahead. Worst thing that happens is you don't get what you want and you learn that it doesn't work in your garden. Okay, I'll do one more and then Catherine, maybe you can do the next set. Um, someone's asking when you can plant seeds in pots to be ready to transplant in mid-May. When's the time to do that? Um, kind of depends on what the seeds are. Um, most packets of seed will give you um, the information that tells you from seed to transplant dates, a lot of them will. Um, if you're saying if you're saying tomatoes, eggplants, and peppers, um, peppers I wouldn't take. You could still maybe get, but but it'll be a while before you're going to be able to get them in the ground. They're usually about eight weeks from seeding to transplant for peppers. With tomatoes, I think four to six weeks you could get something. If, um, but you have to wait for germination. Four to six weeks from germination. But again, I'll go back to what I've said repeatedly, give it a try. Worst thing that happens, you learn something. Are there any more questions? What about powdery mildew? Oh, <laughs> the bane of every squash plant. Yeah. And squash plants with those great big leaves out there collect a, a form of mildew called powdery mildew, particularly a problem in San Francisco uh, and any of the damper areas. Um, and it's just really a nuisance. And it weakens the plant. I wouldn't pull a plant out because I saw some powdery mildew on it, but I would probably cut the powdery mildew leaves off just to have the remove what's called the vector so that the next time we get a kind of a damp spell, there isn't a, a source of mildew to move on to the other parts of the plant. You can, on squash, you can take a fair number of leaves off and still get a crop. Yeah. Uh, what about recommendations for the best in Menlo Park area? The best what? Tomato, I think. Somebody <laughs> wrote down better boy. 
and stupid. Oh, no. And then they changed it to stupus. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I think you mean stupice. It's S T U P I C E. Okay. I've had really good luck with that here in Menlo Park. That was a, that was bred for Oregon and it, it really worked out well for us. Um, Better Boy, I think Better Boy is one of the ones that has very good uh, disease resistance. I'm trying to remember now, but I think that's, a, it's very popular. And usually if it's popular, it's popular because it was successful. Is the Stupix, what size is it? It's kind of medium, a classic, I think. I don't think it gets, well, for me, it doesn't get tremendously big. Okay. Um, Let's see, somebody commented that Bruce Gorin's San Francisco tomato did really well in Aptos. Okay, well, that's um, a real mark in its favor. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the nice things about local hybridizing. And when people, you know, save seeds because they did well, that's how you get a tomato that likes your garden or likes your area. So it's kind of fun. Uh, seed saving is beyond the scope of this presentation, but I think we'll probably have some classes later on toward the seed saving time they'll talk about how you do it and it's really kind of a fun thing to do because you first of all just to see that you can do it but secondly what you're doing is you're actually breeding a plant that likes your garden and those are sometimes called land race plants it's, um, I don't know where that term came from but they basically were very much particularized to a given area what about tools? Can you name tools that are specific for handling tomato seedlings or do we not need to bother with a... Um, I use the point of a pencil and saliva, if that counts as a tool. <laughs> <laughs> They're hard, tomato seeds aren't that hard to pick up, but anything that's hard to pick up, I just take a make-believe this is a pencil and I spit on the end of it so it's damp and put it into the little bunch of seeds and one seed or maybe two will stick to the end and then you can pop it in the soil. And I think that's kind of handy myself. Um, what about for seedlings? For seedlings, oh, my favorite thing for seedlings uh, is a dinner fork. <laughs> you can tell I'm kind of low tech. But dinner forks are nice because they get in between the roots. They don't cut the roots off when you're trying to get the plant out and transplant it. You just take a dinner fork, put maybe two, one on either side and just lever that out and you won't damage the roots very much. And that, I, I like dinner forks for that. And, um, you know, go to the Goodwill or someplace and get some ratty old dinner forks or even those plastic dinner forks work just fine. Okay. Um, somebody commented that the question, does bicarb old-fashioned fungicide work for mildew on tomatoes? Some people have good luck with bicarbonate. Yeah, some people do. Okay. Usually you need a little bit of wetting, wetting uh, along with it. So you put a couple of drops of dishwasher detergent in the water that you have the bicarbonate of soda in. And yeah, it, it can be helpful. Um, it, I found that once you get powdery mildew, it's so overwhelming. Uh, it really causes a lot of grief and I don't know how to prevent it. And pouring bicarbonate on a leaf that's sick, just, I don't know. I don't think it, it doesn't kill it so that, that it won't come back. It, that leaf is done for. Is that baking soda? Is that what that mm -hmm. is? Baking soda. Oh, okay, well, we, we swallow it when we have tummy aches, right? <laughs> um, yeah, and the plant has a tummy ache for sure. <laughs> Uh, and I'll also just mention here some other uh, results people have had with tomatoes. In Menlo Park, somebody said Celebrity was good uh, a couple of times. And then um, San Francisco Sunrise Tomatoes in Menlo Park. Uh, Barbara had a huge or a wonderful crop of huge tomatoes. Uh, that was mentioned a couple of times. And Defiant. Uh, growing in San Francisco and celebrity growing there as well. Um, and I think that's about it. Okay. One other um, tomato chip early. Uh, you get toward the fall and you, you know that 
we're not going to have very much more warm weather and we're going to have a lot shorter days and the short days really affect our plants a lot. Um, take all of the little flowers off the plant because they're not going to turn into anything useful for you. And then the plant puts its energy into the little green fruit trying to get them to ripen. So best to go out hmm, depending on you know your tolerance go out maybe the end of October and start pulling off any of the flowers because they're not going to accomplish much of anything um, for, in the way of setting fruit. And with tomatoes you can ripen the tomatoes inside so you can pull them off if, uh, leave them attached to their stem seems to work best. Um, I wrap mine in newspaper so that they don't have a lot of light and I put them somewhere where it doesn't get too warm and every once in a while I peel back the newspaper and look in there and they ripen up and they taste pretty good. They certainly taste better than the supermarket ones. Okay. Somebody uh, questioned, uh, let's see, where, where do you get seeds for San, Fra San Francisco Sunrise Tomatoes? You know, I don't know if they're commercially available. Uh, is a master gardener who bred them. Does anybody know that whether uh, Bruce Judith, is? Uh, this is Cynthia. I know I, that uh, Bruce um, does uh, market them on eBay. San okay. Francisco Sunrise. Thank you. Thank you. So okay. eBay. And the last question I have is somebody suggested perhaps using milk as a spray to get rid of the fungus. Yeah, a lot of these home remedies um, Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. They're worth a try if you're really, you know, having problems. Uh, they're certainly better than spraying some really strong chemical on there. But I don't think there's been a lot of research done that I could stand behind saying, yes, the University of California agrees milk works. Give it a try, see what happens. And tell everybody, call, um, send, send, call our helpline and uh, you'll, you'll, you'll help us to give better information the next time. Uh, more people are putting in their favorite tomatoes, and we've got a couple of early girl votes uh, for Palo Alto and Menlo Park area. And um, let's see. This, and oh, here's one more question. Does pulling off some of the green tomatoes encourage the remaining fruit to get larger? Theoretically, it should. Yeah, theoretically it should. That's what you do when you're growing um, roses or chrysanthemums or things like that for prizes, you know, at the county fair, who has the biggest uh, chrysanthemum or who has the, the most perfect rose. They, they do what's called just budding. They pull everything off. Um, you probably, if you're going to do it, would want to pull off the tomatoes when they're really little, really little, because if they get to be any good size, it's not going to make much difference, but worth a try. Well, that is about it here as far as the okay. questions. All right. So now we have some references that um, I put together for you. Oh, what happened to the reference slide? Um, they're, they're at the end. Oh, okay. That's a, thank you. <laughs> well, uh, thank you, uh, Judith. That was very uh, informative and delightful, actually. Even as a master gardener, I think we all learn something every time we attend one of your presentations. Um, and I want to thank all of our audience for attending our second spring edibles presentation. The third presentation in the series is entitled Planting Your Spring Vegetable Garden with Kathleen and Lisa Putnam. Uh, you'll be able to find the registration uh, information on the U.S. Master Gardeners of San Mateo and San Francisco County's website. If you had a question that wasn't answered, and we did answer a lot today, you can email your question to the helpline and an MG will respond. Uh, helpline information, a copy of the presentation, and the video link will be found on our MG website um, we will have to wait a little while for the video link within at least a week. A week. So thank everybody for attending and have a very good weekend.